Hello, I'm Dr. Charles Gardner, Medical Officer of Health at the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, here to provide you with the COVID-19 update for Simcoe Muskoka. So when I last, um, since I last reported a week ago, we've had an additional 27 cases. So we have a total of 12,363 cases. Um, and in fact, this is an increase in cases in the past week compared with previous weeks. Uh, and it's the first time in 13 weeks that we've had an increase in a week above the preceding week. And it represents a 44% relative increase compared with the previous week, uh, which was 16 cases um, that had occurred during uh, the week of July the 11th to 17th. So um, we choose uh, you know, a, a calendar week for a comparison. So the week of July the 18th to the 25th, we had 23 cases. The week before that, 16 cases. Uh, and the province has actually gone up uh, over the past week as well, although relatively speaking less by about uh, 5%. Um, At this point in time, we have 31 active cases up from 25 a week ago. Uh, and we've had no additional deaths take place over the past week. So we have a total of 255 deaths that have occurred to date from COVID-19. Uh, we have two individuals in a hospital in Simcoe, Muskoka down from four a week ago and no individuals in the intensive care unit down from one a week ago. And this is actually the first time since September of last year that we've had no individuals from Simcoe Muskoka in the intensive care unit for COVID-19. Uh, the individuals who are uh, currently in hospital uh, range in age, the two individuals range in age from their 50s to their 70s. Uh, one, uh, did not um, have a record of having been vaccinated. One had received a single dose of vaccine less than 14 days before the onset of symptoms. So um, uh, too late to have, uh, be able to provide protection. Uh, we've had eight cases over the course of the weekend, five, course, five cases over the past 24 hours. All are sporadic, two male, three are female. Their ages range from under 10 to in their 40s. All living in Simcoe County. Um, four of them acquired their investigation um, by means that's under investigation right now, acquired their, their infection uh, by means that's under investigation right now. And one was acquired uh, in the community, which means that we don't know exactly how they acquired it. Um, all are self-isolating. Um, four of them were unvaccinated. One had received a single dose of vaccine. Uh, our active cases are uh, located overwhelmingly in the southern portion of our territory. Uh, Barrie, Bradford, West Gwillenbury, Innisfil, Collingwood, and Oromodonte. All of our municipalities have an incidence of less than five cases per 100,000 population. Uh, per week. And uh, the age group with the highest incidence of cases is actually uh, teenagers followed by people, uh, young adults between the ages of 18 and 34. Our uh, overall incidence of cases for Simcoe Muskoka is 3.8 cases per 100,000 population per week, um, which is up from 2.6 cases per 100,000 per week the preceding week. And the province right now has an incidence of 7.5 cases per 100,000 population per week, up from 7.1 last week. So our incidence is at this point just over half of the incidence of the province. Uh, the Delta variant uh, continues to be dominant in Simcoe Muskoka as it is in the province. So 88% of our cases in the past week uh, were found to be Delta variant cases. And we do have a new graph um, on our Health Stats website under the variants folder, uh, which specifically identifies the trajectory of the dominant variant, the Delta variant, relative to uh, the other uh, variants. 
At this point in time, we have no outbreaks from COVID-19. We continue to make progress with regards to immunization. So to date, we have immunized uh, over uh, 748,000 doses, administered over, over 748,000 doses of vaccine. And this is up uh, over 44,000 doses over the past week. Um, the majority of these, some 85%, uh, were uh, second doses to individuals, the remainder being first doses to individuals. Uh, so uh, we were making very good uh, progress on second doses, and we continue to make some progress on first doses as well. 78% um, of those who are eligible in Simcoe Muskoka, those who are 12 years of age and older, have received their first dose, and 61%, 61.5% have received their second dose. So uh, to compare with the province, we're uh, just a little bit behind when it comes to um, the percent coverage with first doses, the province being 69.1%, ourselves being 67.2%. This is for people 12 years of age and older. And we're about five percentage points um, behind the province when it comes to second doses. So the province is 52.8% and we are 47.5%. And um, we, uh, we are continuing at a rate that's a little bit higher than the provincial rate for uh, per capita administration of vaccine. And um, we are progressing at a rate such that uh, we um, are lagging by five days behind the provincial mean. In five days, we'll have caught up to what the provincial average is right now. Um, if we look at youth, those uh, 12 to 17 years of age, which is age group that is trailing behind in immunization, partly because they were the last group to be eligible to receive vaccine. Um, they presently uh, have a first dose coverage of 66% and a two dose coverage of 38%. Uh, and that is a very important group, of course, to immunize because uh, we want to do all that we can to have them ready for school, uh, those that are older for college, young adults ready for college or for the workforce. Um, and uh, need to get immunization up as high as we can in all age groups and, and in, including those age, those age groups. If we look at our dashboard for Simcoe Muskoka, we, we remain in yellow status unchanged from last week. Viral spread and containment has moved into yellow from green status because we've had an increase in um, transmission. And um, also, our reproduction number has gone up to 1.3 from 1.2 last week. So anything above one means that there's growth in the pandemic happening uh, here. Uh, so we definitely want to move it back below one. Uh, laboratory testing remains in green status with a very good turnaround time uh, for tests and a percent positivity that remains at 0.3%, unchanged from last week and very low. Uh, health system capacity remains in yellow status because of high acute bed utilization, not for COVID, but for other reasons. And uh, the public health system capacity remains in yellow, um, unchanged from a week ago because um, our uh, response time for contacts of cases is uh, a little uh, lower than we would like it. We'd like it above 90%, it's actually at 76.8%, down a bit from last week at 81.8%. The reason for that is because we're finding that there's a, an increase in the number of contacts per case that's been occurring as we've moved into um, the steps of reopening in the province. So uh, more people for us to follow up as contacts. Many, many of those turn out to be immunized, which greatly reduces that risk, but nevertheless, many people for us to follow up. And moving to my media notes, um, we are going to be commencing a gradual ramping down of our mass immunization clinics through the course of August, such that we will have finished 
uh, those clinics by the end of August. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because uh, we anticipate that we will have reached all people who are, are uh, readily coming out to receive the first and second dose by that point in time. We are on a trajectory to get to 75% coverage um, by mid-August uh, for a second dose, which is the provincial target uh, for moving into step three. So um, therefore, uh, after that point, we really need to be focusing on those who have a harder time coming out to be immunized and uh, those who are hesitant. And to do that, we're going to continue to rely on community pharmacies, of which we have over 130 participating in immunization, primary care, family practices, and our own pop-up clinics, identifying areas and locations and populations uh, that require that kind of attention, bringing vaccination closer to them instead. Um, and so, um, as we move towards the end of the month and discontinue our um, mass immunization clinics, uh, we will be also discontinuing a employment for uh, uh, quite a, a substantial number of people who came on to work for us to help us with our immunization clinics. And uh, at this time, I really want to take a moment to thank those people for coming and helping us out as we've needed them in our response for immunization. We've also had a number come on to help us with case and contact management and with outbreak response and other, other needs as well in the agency. I just want to extend our gratitude to those people. Um, we are reducing some of the numbers for those other uh, purposes as well uh, as we've had a, a marked reduction in cases. Um, but I do want to thank them for helping us in our hour of need in responding to this, the pandemic of the century. I also want to, of course, extend my expression of gratitude to my staff, longstanding staff who will continue with us, uh, for continuing uh, with us and for being adaptable as we've had to redeploy staff uh, throughout the pandemic to where they've been needed in the response. I also want to thank the, the hundreds of volunteers that have continued to help us in many ways and most definitely in our immunization clinics and our many partner agencies as well, primary care, community pharmacies, uh, hospitals, paramedic services or municipalities with regards to the use of their facilities. Uh, just um, really, it's been a whole of community of response, and I do express my gratitude to you all. And of course, um, many are going to be needed further into the future as well. Uh, those partner agencies can needed, many of them for immunization purposes, and of course, for um, management of cases, case and contact management. Um, we, we continue with a whole of community response to the pandemic. We are launching a vaccine hesitancy campaign, which we are calling Don't Wait, Vaccinate. This is a, a media campaign, a social media campaign using um, paid media as well as uh, some social influencers among youth in order to reach uh, those that perhaps are more hesitant to come forward to receive immunization. We're giving a particular focus on younger people, youth and young adults, and um, men below the age of 40, uh, as well as uh, racialized neighborhoods and uh, lower income individuals. Um, and uh, we uh, will be continuing with this on uh, paid media for a two week period, but continuing with the social media for an indefinite period of time. Uh, this has been based on uh, our, the review of our own data, as well as focus groups that we've done on youth, those who've been immunized and those who have not, in order to understand um, what the issues are, what would motivate, what kind of language would resonate with them. Some of our key messages will be as follows get vaccinated. Uh, getting vaccinated protects you, your loved ones, and your whole community. 
Getting vaccinated will help us get back to the people, places, and activities we love. Getting vaccinated is safe. Getting vaccinated is effective. And getting vaccinated is a positive experience. And we have routinely throughout the entirety of our vaccination campaign had very positive feedback on uh, how the how the uh, the clinics have run and um, the professionalism and how quickly and efficient things happen and how safe they are. Uh, so um, we uh, indeed need to be effective in reaching people uh, to get everybody to come forward as many people as possible to get our vaccination coverage up as high as possible so that we can come as close as possible to, to herd immunity, to protecting as many people and protecting the people around those people um, to avoid transmission and being ready for our schools to open, uh, colleges and universities to open. Um, this is actually the week in which um, those who are gonna be going back to primary and secondary school, um, if they get their vaccine this week, they would be protected going back to school they wait later. Of course, there'll be some protection, but they'll, they'll be a bit delayed in having full protection just because of the interval between the first and the second dose and that we're looking for a two week interval after the second dose before you have full protection. Uh, but, uh, but we will continue working forward in time, uh, in, um, making uh, opportunities available for people to get immunized. Um, uh, another area of messaging is with regards to summer events and upcoming long weekends. So now that we're in step three, there are much larger venues that are open to people. People can have outdoor gatherings of up to 100 people, 25 people indoors, and there can be events that are larger in size. We've had applications as a health unit for many uh, community events uh, that will take place. Um, through the remainder of the summer. And I think it's important for people to remember that we continue to have public health measures in place to help keep us safe. We have noted a bit of a rise in cases right now. We don't want that to continue. We want that to come back down again and stay down again. And so it's important that everybody abide by the really key control measures that they can do for themselves. So for the venues, it's a matter of limiting um, entry to uh, the restricted numbers uh, that are inherent to the regulation uh, such that people will be able to physically distance. Uh, but for individuals, you need to be physically distancing from people outside of your household. Uh, outside is safer than inside for meeting people, much safer. Um, you should continue to use a mask in indoor public spaces as required by regulation or even outdoors if you're um, unable to maintain the physical distancing. People who develop symptoms need to isolate and seek uh, medical attention and assessment. And uh, hand hygiene is always an important um, public health measure as well. So I have um, uh, more information about uh, this whole topic of summer events on our website. So uh, for, for more information, please have a look at our website. Uh, so we have the following media questions. If someone has been infected with COVID-19, would they have adequate immunity from the virus or would they need to get the COVID-19 vaccine as well? So we do advise that everybody um, who is eligible, 12 years of age and above, who doesn't have um, a true medical contraindication to COVID-19, and they're actually a very small proportion of the population that would fall into that category, that they receive full immunization, two doses, including those who've been infected in the past with COVID-19. Um, we believe that you're, you're going to get better protection that way and less um, immunity waning that way. So uh, we do advise that uh, such people come forward to receive immunization. Uh, is Simcomiscoca still behind the provincial vaccination rates? And if so, what are the reasons for this and what is being done to address this issue? So as I'd indicated earlier, we are behind the provincial rate, uh, just under 2% for um, first dose coverage and just in the range of 5% uh, behind the province for second dose coverage. And this equates to about a five day delay before uh, catching up with where the province is right now. 
Uh, and we are actually administering vaccination at a higher rate on a per capita basis than the provinces right now. The reason why we are delayed is because uh, we've had a low incidence of COVID-19 on the whole for our district throughout the pandemic. Most of the time, about half of the provincial rate and about a quarter of the rate in the greater Toronto area. We've had only one hot spot, whereas um, throughout the greater Toronto area and in Ottawa, they've been designated as having many hot spots and ha have for most of the campaign uh, received more immunization from the province, more vaccine from the province uh, to help protect um, those very vulnerable populations and help respond to the high transmission rate in those areas. And uh, I, I fully support that approach. It was in keeping with recommendations from the science table that identified that uh, there'd be less transmission and lives would be saved with this approach. Um, and uh, so I think uh, and continue to believe that this is the right thing for the province to have done. Uh, but it has resulted in us receiving less vaccine than the average um, health unit on a per capita basis throughout the campaign. Uh, and um, uh, so we do what we can to catch up with a higher um, delivery rate right now. Uh, also, um, this is a destination of choice for travelers uh, from elsewhere in the province. And um, we have found that we have been delivering, administering more vaccine uh, to uh, people from out of district than uh, have our citizens been receiving out of district. Uh, and so that has made it more challenging for us to be able to um, keep up with the provincial coverage rate for our population. We are doing all we can to make vaccination accessible to people. And so people uh, certainly can um, take advantage of walk-ins. And we do uh, make uh, walk-ins available at all of our clinics for first doses and um, at a number of our clinics for second doses. And you can look at our website to see the details about uh, the availability of drop-ins for second doses. Um, there is a, a preferential advantage for local people uh, for drop-ins to be able to receive vaccine, we've found, so that does help us. And our pop-up clinics also help us um, to reach local people. And uh, at times in the past, we've also used our own booking system instead of the provincial system to help uh, allow for um, access to immunization bookings for uh, people, particularly in our border areas, such as in Bradford, West Willenberry, to help uh, those people be able to um, have access to immunization. Uh, and we are carrying out our campaign that we're just starting uh, with an, an launch of media materials tomorrow um, to uh, reach the hesitant uh, to uh, help prompt them to come forward to receive immunization. And we are committed going forward beyond uh, the closure of our, our mass immunization clinics with uh, an ongoing campaign with uh, pop-up clinics and the use of uh, primary care and community pharmacies to continue to provide immunization to, uh, to the hesitant. Um, we're also at this time advising that people who had bookings farther out in the future beyond the end of August, um, change their booking to be during the month of August. And that'll help accelerate uptake of uh, vaccine. Uh, and uh, we're reaching those individuals by email and when necessary by phone to help that happen as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on children who are not vaccinated returning to extracurricular activities and school in the fall? So I would say there are two categories of such children. Those who are under 12 years of age for whom um, vaccination is not um, at this point allowed that uh, will quite possibly change later in the year but at this point in time uh, they're not included as being eligible to receive vaccine and then there are children who are 12 and above who can receive vaccine so I would say we have to do all that we can to support and encourage youth 12 and above to receive vaccine immunization uh, in the ways that I've already described um, and for the younger children and, and for those who are older children, um, we need to ensure that the school environment is as safe as we can make it. Uh, the province will be coming forward in the near future with a release of their approach to safe schools. Um, and the science table 
uh, for the province has released their recommendations about safe schools where they've taken a, a tiered approach in, in which uh, more uh, safety precautions um, akin to the kind of precautions that were in place over the last year would be required if you have high degrees of transmission, if there are low degrees of transmission that they would be recommending less in the way of restrictions and uh, therefore enabling more in the way of the extracurricular activities. So uh, we shall see what's actually brought forward as policy from the province on that. So at this point, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Gardner, for your update. Um, we'll take questions from the media. As always, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and one follow up, uh, just in consideration of time. And we will start with Chris Simon from the Barry Advance. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Gardner. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there was a memo that was on the uh, City of Barry's um, uh, circulation list uh, from last week about the health unit requiring a $5 million uh, line of credit. Um, what happens, I guess, if you can't uh, get that, uh, can't get that permission from the municipalities? And do you feel like you've been, to a certain extent, left high and dry by the province for not providing adequate funding for uh, handling this pandemic locally? Well, I would say that that is certainly a very important matter that the Board of Health is addressing, that we do need to ensure that we have the financial resources to be able to, to carry out the response, uh, that uh, at this point in time, we're joining many other health units that have had to do this, go forward and obtain access to a loan if need be, um, as uh, uh, we await funding from the province um, shortly after issuing that letter, uh, we did actually receive notice from the province indicating that they would be securing and providing us with just under 50% of the amount that was requested, the additional financing um, that was part of the budget submitted to the province in February. And that uh, through the remainder of the year, they would be assessing uh, our financial needs to determine further allocations of funds. Um, if we were not to get um, beyond that amount, indeed, we would need access to other funds, um, but we will need access, the Board of Health will need access to uh, the potential for a loan or line of credit um, to manage uh, cash flow needs in the interim if uh, the remainder of the funds don't come in a timely way. Okay. And um, are you at all concerned by the fact that the province has not released its back to school plan at this point? I expect it to be coming soon. Um, I, uh, I think it would be helpful to have it earlier. It would give us more time to work with it. I would say I'm, I'm not quite concerned, but I do expect it soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next question. Um, Don Huddlestone from the Huntsville Doppler. Do you have a question? Nothing for me today. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Mike Arcelides from CTV Barry. You nailed it. Hello. Doctor, vaccine passports oh. are the uh, topic that are um, gaining some traction right now. Where do you stand on this with regard to the idea of not, I don't want to use the word segregating, but that's what it is, um, vaccinated individuals from those who are not. Um, the, uh, the Board of Health has had a, 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 a position on this. I believe that um, it would be prudent for the province to consider the potential for a vaccine certificate uh, as a way of enabling um, the economy to remain open if we end up with a surge of in cases, it, it uh, may be a method to help reduce the impact on businesses um, and um, uh, allow for some safety with uh, businesses to, to continue uh, being open, services to, be, to continue to be open. So I do believe it's, it's uh, worthy of consideration on the part of the province in keeping with the recommendations of the science table. Uh, not necessarily a follow-up 
at response, however, what, where do you stand with regard to the hesitancy that results having you know visited many sites with the mixing of doses? Is that contributing to the lower numbers we're seeing here? Because folks saying, I want my double Pfizer, or I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. What do you say to those folks? And what do you say to the stats being indicative of that reality? We have encountered some instances of individuals that um, declined to receive a second dose when they came into our clinic because the uh, the vaccine that was available to them wasn't what they wanted, and instead they have chosen, to, I guess, to come back when they can get what they prefer. Um, and this is not by any means um, an exclusive issue with regards to Simcoe Muskoka. I hear from my colleagues across the province that this has been a fairly common issue. Um, and uh, so I, I uh, would encourage such people to accept uh, the first vaccine that's available to them, not to delay, um, to uh, um, not take the risk associated with delay. There's a potential for them to become infected in the interim. Uh, and it's important that they, re- they actually receive uh, the vaccine uh, that's presented to them. We do what we can to match their second dose with their first dose. Um, so, uh, you know, the degree to which this can be a challenge depends on the supply that we have at the time. Um, at this point in time, we have a uh, plentiful supply of Pfizer vaccine. That's been the dominant vaccine all the way through. And there's been a great increase in the amount of that in the latter part of um, July and going into August. Um, and it, anyway, I, I do believe that it has been an issue to some degree, but not just for us. It's been an issue across the province. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Brett Glover from Barry 360. Thank you very much, Heather, and good afternoon, Dr. Gardner. Uh, I'm curious about your guidance regarding workplaces in Simcoe Muskoka. I believe your last provided a letter of instructions to businesses and organizations March 11th. And I'm wondering if you'll be providing updated guidance or ending the requirements laid out in that letter altogether. We've recently reviewed it. We still feel that it's it's a very good set of uh, guidance. Um, and it's not in any way in, in conflict with the contents of Um, what's within regulation for step three of the roadmap. I think what would be really um, important for us is to see what happens when the province moves beyond step three, what comes from uh, from the province with regards to uh, moving away from regulation, uh, the degree to which what we would have in that letter would supersede or go beyond what the province um, would require and to determine whether or not we would wanna change it in any way. Uh, It's really important that uh, we would look at the situation and say, well, what do we feel we need happening here at this point in time? So at the moment, we believe that it um, is a good product as written, but we'll we'll need to wait and see what happens as we do leave step three. Well, and speaking of uh, step three, this rise in cases across the region and the province comes as we approach uh, the two-week mark of being in the province mm-hmm. of step three. Was this increase to be expected? It's a very good question. Uh, it's not good news. And so we look at it with um, some concern. And I think it's a matter of reiterating the importance of people following the remaining public health measures. If I think back to a year ago, as we were moving through steps at that time to reopen the economy, with each step, there was a transient rise in cases that occurred about two weeks after uh, the change, uh, which then came back down again. So we'll see if that happens this time or if it is the beginning of a rise. Um, But uh, I, I would say with it being less than two weeks, we may very well be seeing the effect of uh, be, of um, the openings that took place in uh, step two as much as what's happening in step three. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Mandy Webster from Rogers, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, Mark Claremont, Muskoka Today. Do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, Doctor, I see that in Britain they're talking about handing out a third vaccine for people who uh, 
who may have gotten the AZ and are thinking of travel, have you had any guidance from that from the province or federally? So we have had that question arise uh, from individuals who are concerned about travel restrictions that may be imposed by other countries or cruise lines uh, uh, for people that um, had mixed vaccines, not necessarily the AstraZeneca. Uh, and I also note that in Quebec, they're um, moving in the direction of providing an additional third dose to people for that kind of purpose. But that's not recommended by the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. And um, nor is it recommended by the um, Ministry of Health for the province. So we aren't contemplating that at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Now back to uh, certainly up here in Muskoka, the, the uh, uh, campers are uh, out and about in the streets and given the low rates of, uh, of uptake on vaccines there, when do you think you might see some uh, specific numbers relative to cases uh, that may have come through camps? And where do you stand as far as uh, mm -hmm. vaccinations at camps? I know you're not doing them physically at camps, but. Mm -hmm. So with regards to our camps, uh, we've um, certainly kept a very close eye on our camps to the very best of our ability. We. Uh, provided them with the province's draft requirements in mid-June and then followed up with the final guidelines from the province about uh, overnight camps and how they're operated uh, at the end of June uh, and have made site visits working through them uh, to ensure that the, the camps are safe as is our usual practice. It's been um, a compressed timeline for us because uh, the, for one, um, we've been extremely stretched responding to the pandemic, responding to the third wave of the pandemic leading into uh, when camps are opening up. And also there was some delay in the province uh, completing their guidelines for the operation at camp. So even now we're working with camps to ensure they're, they're protected. They, they um, have, I think quite stringent requirements for safety for um, reduced uh, exposure in the camp among the campers they are kept into cohorts uh, for their cabins and otherwise have to be physically distanced and if indoors using masks uh, when encountering uh, other campers from other cohorts. Um, there's increased sanitation there's daily monitoring for symptoms and uh, the, the requirement to report potential cases and test potential cases and isolate potential cases. Uh, so, so far we've had no reported COVID cases or outbreaks in any of our camps, but um, it's certainly a situation uh, that requires our, our attention. Good, thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, are there any questions from the phone lines? Marge Bruneman here from Barrie today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again for this. Um, I am interested in uh, the vaccine uh, program and any considerations to push that envelope a little bit more in terms of uh, bringing the vaccine to the people to reach mm -hmm. that herd immunity, um, to identified uh, low vaccinated neighborhoods or mm -hmm. any door-to-door -door campaigns. Are you considering any of these things uh, in the uh, the near future or as we approach um, getting back to school? Indeed, we want to do all that we can to bring vaccination to people, make it easy for people, particularly the hesitant, to uh, address their concerns, uh, barriers that may exist. Uh, and so uh, we have been conducting pop-up clinics beyond the 13 community clinics that are uh, spaced throughout all of Simca Muskoka. And we'll continue to do that, um, including after we've stopped our mass immunization clinics by the end of August. And uh, we'll be looking, continuing to look at our data as to what are the uh, geographic areas uh, where we've been following behind, following behind or um, what subpopulations, what neighborhoods are more affected, what groups uh, can we partner with to 
uh, bring uh, our pop-up clinics to those particular areas to make it easy for people to be immunized. Uh, we're doing outreach to those who've got bookings beyond August so that that can be done sooner um, before we close down our clinics. And we'll carry out and continue to carry out our media campaign. Thank you. Those are my questions. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone who's not yet had an opportunity to ask a question? Can I jump okay. in from CTV News again? Is that okay? Yes, yes, you may. Doctor, uh, what is the, are we going to have a fourth wave? What is September going to look like? in your estimation, based on what we're seeing, mm -hmm. we're seeing. Well, I do know that our medical officer of health is concerned about uh, a rise in cases. He's indicated that he fully anticipates a rise in COVID-19 cases based on uh, its uh, the Delta variant's transmissibility and based on uh, the seasonality of this virus as well. And the fact that as you get into colder weather, people move into the indoors more for social contact and uh, therefore a transmission um, potentially increases with that. I, I think I would agree with the chief medical officer of health that we are gonna see some degree of rise. Hopefully the rise that we've just seen is not gonna continue that it would come back down again, but we shall see. Um, but uh, I do expect some degree of a rise. I think the question would be how much. Um, I fully anticipate that those who are immunized are going to be much better protected, much less likely to become cases. But at this point in time, we still have a, a substantial proportion of our population that is unvaccinated. And we, we, of course, have children under 12 who cannot get vaccinated. So that's um, enough people uh, who uh, could um, become cases and transmit uh, for us to have uh, at least some degree of a surge. We're going to have a normal Christmas this year? Hmm. You know, I, I don't think it would be safe to say um, at this point when we're still in a pandemic that, that we could have a normal Christmas per se. I'm sure that we will... Uh, need to be cautious. Um, those who are vaccinated, I think, would be in a better position to have more of a normal Christmas. Uh, and that would be a, one of the really good reasons why um, people should be seeking immunization, those that are eligible. But um, I think it would be safer to assume that there'll be at least some caution needed at Christmas. Thank you. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who hasn't had an opportunity to ask a question? Okay, well, that concludes today's media briefing. Uh, our next media briefing will be on Tuesday, August 17th at 2pm. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.